waiting another 10 seconds. Uh, okay, uh, welcome everybody to uh, CFA Colloquium. Uh, we have a very uh, nice and excellent speaker today. We have a variable star as well. Variable <laughs> star up there, yes. Uh, so Sarah Markov is our colloquium speaker, mm. and uh, I have uh, this page to tell me every. I'll tell you everything about uh, Sarah. I had to put it on my uh, page uh, because that's a lot of uh, uh, information actually about her. Uh, so Sarah was an undergrad at MIT with Claude Canizares, uh, but her first uh, paper and first project was uh, done here with Martin Elvis and Jonathan McDowell, and it was on the Quasar PG-1407 plus 265, which is very nice bright Redshift 1 source. The, it is very different source than uh, she studied now, right? She studies now. Then uh, she uh, went to University of uh, Arizona and did her PhD in theoretical astrophysics program there. And she finished, uh, graduated in 2000. Uh, this is, uh, you know, after she graduated, I think she was uh, briefly visiting CFA. And this is where uh, we uh, worked. And Sarah doesn't remember that probably. I'm waiting. To that see. we worked on the low luminosity uh, accreting black hole in IC 1459. Uh, and this was one of those uh, low luminosity uh, sources which were discovered with Chandra. So low luminosity ADAF type sources. In case of Sarah and in case of this source, we actually use uh, Sarah model, jet model, to fit the spectrum because the ADAF model didn't work. So we had to use Sarah. So this was the only work I've done with Sarah, but we, we had a lot of contact over the years. After she graduated, she went uh, for her first postdoc and she was a Humboldt fellow at MPI in Bonn, in radio astronomy in Bonn. And this is where she was interested in jets and really got involved in jet uh, uh, theory and observations. Uh, second postdoc, uh, she came back to the States and she was actually at MIT as an NSF uh, fellow in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, and she used to came, come to CFA every week for science education lunches. And this was the big outreach uh, she was involved here. And this year, uh, she also won the Willem de Graaf Prize of the Royal Dutch Astronomical Society, which is awarded for public outreach. In 2006, uh, she started as a faculty at University of Amsterdam, and now she is a full professor, <coughs> and uh, she runs research group there, and she won top Dutch career awards, VD and VG. Uh, what's interesting is that Sarah speaks Dutch very fluently. Mm. <laughs> in <tw> the <laughs> Netherlands, <laughs> yeah. So in 2014, uh, she was named Fellow of American Physical Society, which is a very high uh, achievement for Sarah. And uh, she's also a part of uh, EHT collaboration. She's on the Science Council and coordinates multi-wavelength and proposals of the working group. And of course, she's also a CTA collaborator, or she's part of CTA collaboration. Right, so today we will uh, hear from Sarah about her research and recent interests in research. All right, hi everyone, hi again to those people who saw me at the uh, lunch talk. Um, and I apologize if I'm coughing a little bit. My throat is, is kind of uh, scratchy today. So anyway, thanks to Anita and, uh, for, the, for the intro. And it was kind of like a, almost a talk. <laughs> and, um, and to the organizers for inviting me here. It's, it's really nice to come back. Like I said, I've been coming to CFA regularly since I was basically about like 20. Um, I won't say how long ago that was, but it was quite a while. And uh, it's always a nice place. But I haven't really given that many formal talks here. I think this is only the second time that I've given a formal talk in this room. So it's kind of fun. Anyway, um, so those of you who know me 
you know, I've already had people ask, like, why are you not talking about EHT? There's a lot going on. It's kind of surprising. And I figured that with Shep and the crew here, um, you know, in the Black Hole Institute, that you're probably hearing a little bit, maybe more than you want to hear about EHT lately. I don't know. So, I mean, of course, there can never be too much. So I will have a little bit about it in there. But I wanted to instead talk about a problem that I find really interesting. I mentioned this in the abstract. It's something I've been struggling with at various stages of my career, things that I look at. Um, but it's relevant to EHT because what you have, you know, basically is we look at a black hole and there's these amazing jets that are being launched. And the way we see the jets, of course, is via the light that's being produced in them. And the problem is that we don't really have a model at the moment, like a predictive, self-consistent end to end model for how the regions near the black hole influence uh, and shape what's going on out here and the light that's being produced. And so what that means is that we can't really unambiguously work backwards from what we see to have a model of, of the source physics. And I mean, this is a pretty common problem, I think, in a lot of areas of astrophysics. But for EHT, it's important um, understanding how the light is produced to, to interpret our images. But if we want to connect what we're seeing at really tiny scales compared to the whole system, um, which is what we see you know, near the event horizon, to these larger scale jets, which is where a lot of the impact is happening um, and the energy release, then of course having a predictive model would be really nice and really understanding this. And so um, this is a problem that a lot of people have been thinking about in different ways. I'm not like the first person to do this, of course. Um, I might be the first person to have the audacity to talk about X-ray binaries and EHT in the same talk. So I'm interested in combining different ways of looking at a problem. And I'm going to talk about this, this question really in several different ways. Um, I don't have the answer. Um, I, I've realized I like giving talks that are more work of progress talks to show you the way that things are, you know, what we're thinking about. And I like hearing those kinds of talks. Um, so there'll be a lot of, I really want to explain the problem to you. And I know this is a mixed audience, so it'll be pretty pedagogical uh, in the beginning. And then towards the end, I'll show you where we're getting some clues about how to start understanding this, this uh, you know, sort of how the dynamics is influencing the production of light, which is this problem that we're having in many different areas in astrophysics and, and how that touches on it. So I um, just want to mention quickly that this is work that I've done with a lot of people. Um, I work as part of the EHT collaboration, of course, and there's a collaboration called Jackpot, which is uh, sort of a loose federation of people who look at X-ray binaries and transients in the multi-wavelength. Um, and I work with a lot of young people, and everybody who you see in orange is either a uh, student or postdoc from my group who's worked with me, and I always put their names in orange so you can see how much is being really led by young people in the group. Okay, so when you think about black hole energy release, I think a lot of people, especially outside um, you know, the, the area of accretion physics, are thinking about the, the big picture effects, like how, how you affect um, cosmology and galaxy evolution. And I love these huge simulations, like illustrious here, where um, people have known for, actually since about 2006-ish or so, there, there was these first simulations where they realized that if they just let gravity do its work, you would end up over-predicting how many massive galaxies that you would get compared to reality. And so then people started putting in the gastrophysics, and these explosions involve black holes, but also supernova and stellar feedback, and you find that you get the right answer, you know, that, that these simulations now give you the right distribution, for instance, of galaxies. But, you know, it's, it's a bit interesting because um, we don't fully understand how black holes are releasing energy in the different channels. And I always kind of wonder a bit, are there other things that could be tuned? I mean, maybe the black hole feedback we put in isn't necessarily correct and maybe lambda CDM is a bit off. I mean, it's, it's hard to really, you know, people don't want to talk about it. And maybe at these big scales, it doesn't matter so much. But as the simulations start to get more um, small scale and closer to the level of actually looking at individual <laughs> star formations and stellar clusters, I think that this is going to become a more interesting problem of how black holes release energy. So this, this question of, of what comes out as a function of what comes in and how we can understand it based on the light and this kind of disconnect between the two is really central to this but to a lot of problems. Um, I'm, this is sort of a boilerplate slide that you see a lot, but I've talked about cosmology, but of course there's also the ionization that we think that you know, black holes did also in the early universe. Um, I won't go into detail, just flashing some pictures. I think people like Avi Loeb have worked on this here. Um, but we think that 
that black holes um, can actually maybe do ionization today. And I mentioned this in the ITC lunch talk, if people were listening or were there, that cosmic rays might be more prevalent than we think, coming from things like X-ray binaries, small black holes in the galaxy, and this could be important. And then, of course, high-energy particles is something I'm really interested in. <clears throat> so um, to understand all of these problems, we have to get to the heart of what's happening with what comes out as a function of as what goes in and how it makes the light. Oh, yeah, and of course, you know, it doesn't have to be just for black holes. A lot of us here are now interested in things like the electromagnetic counterparts of neutron star mergers. And even though it's not a black hole at the center, eventually black holes made, but we now know from um, the work of people like Muli et al. that a jet is coming out of these sources and doing, giving a lot of the power, and so we'd like to be able to interpret that as well. So if you want to get a sense of the problem, I always love this image. This is actually um, from uh, EHT colleague uh, Monica Moschkebrodz's work way before EHT was even a formal collaboration in 2014. But a lot of us were already thinking about this problem of how do you make images and how do you um, what we literally call paint the simulations in some sense. And so what you're looking at is a panel. I'll go through this, but it's all the same simulation underlying it. And then the point is that in these ideal general relativistic magnetohydrodynamical simulations, or GRMHD simulations, um, we basically don't decide, most of the time we're not looking at protons versus electrons. Electrons are what usually gives us the light. We're pushing around a massive particle, which we call the proton. And then if we want to make the light from it, we have to assume that there's an electron for every proton. We make an assumption. And then we have to decide how those electrons are heated, because that's not part at a, you know, that's not calculated self-consistently within the current simulations. And so what happens is you can do something as simple as saying that there's a fixed ratio between the proton temperature and the electron temperature so that we assume they're all thermal and then we can make an image based on, you know, the, we'll have information about the density and the magnetic fields and make a picture from synchrotron. And so that's what you see. Each column here is the image prediction for different frequencies. So, of course, this is the EHT frequency, a sort of a zoom in. And then each row here is showing you a different choice in that fixed parameter. And what you note is, for instance, um, it does make a difference for the EHT images. And so if we're trying to interpret our images, this becomes important, although <clears throat> it's, um, you know, depending on how much you also have to convolve this with the beam of the telescope and so on. But luckily, you note that the ring feature really sort of dominates, and that's how we got, in a way, lucky with the M87 result, is that that ring feature was dominated by the gravitational light bending. So we were a little bit, it was a little easier. We didn't have to necessarily understand all the microphysics quite yet, but that is something we will have to understand to go further. But if you look, for instance, at this difference here, just a factor of three in that choice of how you energize these electrons, <clears throat> basically the same underlying physics either lights up the disk or lights up the jet. So you can start to understand that there's this big degeneracy in these choices that we make, and we have to get to understanding better, you know, on a more self-consistent level, how this is actually done. And so I think this is a beautiful example of this, and um, many people in the collaboration are working on this. There's the moves to make this much more physically realistic. Um, and so, you know, we, we sort of have all the pieces. We've got these really nice simulations that make things that look kind of like jets. Um, we have, this is my artistic rendition of microphysics <laughs> that we layer on top, and then somehow we can make an image or we can make a spectrum. But the problem is that I would call this reactive modeling. You know, you give us a spectrum, you give us an image, and we can mock up a pretty reasonable physical model that makes some sense, you know? The problem is that sometimes we have more than one of these models. Probably more often than not, we have more than one of these models. And so what we want to do is be able to work backwards. So I keep saying the same thing in different ways, but I hope that that makes sense, that that's kind of the core problem, is how do we connect these large-scale flows and what's happening in the dynamics of these particle physics, and, um, and can we find creative ways of learning about this? OK, so I'm going to go way back, and the AGN people in the room can take a nap. But I want to talk about how jets work a little bit, and especially the kinds of jets that we're looking at with, for instance, the Event Horizon Telescope, or with a lot like blazars, um, these bright jet-dominated sources, AGM, where we're mostly looking at the jets. And when you look at these sources, um, what you see is sort of the inner, you're looking at the inner jet, often called the core in the AGN community, but you're interested in the region, which is more or less causally connected to the black hole because you're trying to understand this inflow-outflow problem. 
And already back decades ago, people realized that these things had a signature emission in the radio, which was a flat spectrum. So I'm going to always, I'm going to take you through this really slowly because this is one of the most important slides. And a lot of the slides that come afterwards, I'm going to be explaining based on these kind of phenomenology. So that's why I'm going a bit slow. So Blanford and Conigal, you know, it wasn't obvious from a synchrotron spectrum how you would get a flat spectrum. And I'm going to show you why that would be. So they were the first to really lay out um, why this might be happening. And they said, let's just say a kid jet is really just some kind of like a fire hose, more or less. Let's say fixed opening angle. Some stuff is coming in. You have some injection rate, which is usually tied to the accretion rate maybe of the black hole. A fixed velocity, fixed opening angle. So very simple. Then it's really easy to calculate from conservation laws all the, you know, the magnetic, you make some partition of energy between magnetic fields and density. And then you can just figure out the profile along the jet. And if you do that, you take, say, one slice somewhere in the jet, you say, what kind of emission would be coming out? Now, in jets from observations, we see power laws very often, and that tells us that we have particle acceleration that gives us uh, this classic non-thermal shape. But synchrotron, so you would get a synchrotron power law, and technically this might go pretty far back, but because these jets are quite um, compact, you have a phenomenon called synchrotron self-absorption, where the same, um, basically, um, electrons kind of, in effect, absorb back the light. I mean, it's, it's, it's just the reverse of a, of a scat quantum scattering process uh, with virtual photons from the magnetic field is the way you can kind of think about it. So the light being produced can also be unproduced. But what that means is that you can truncate this distribution. <clears throat> and so a spectrum from just one slice of this jet would be peaking uh, and this is what we would call the photosphere. So it's basically sort of the, the tau equals one surface of that piece of the jet at a particular frequency. And now, if you move to the next part of the jet, what's going to happen? And what Blanford and Conigal showed was that with this very simple kind of conserved jet, what happens is you can um, calculate that the size of the region inversely scales with the frequency you're looking at. So the point is that um, if you pick a part of the jet here, and now let's say I'm going to move further out away from the black hole, then I'm moving down in frequency, so I'm moving to a larger scale in the system. And you get this conspiracy where basically the flux of where that photosphere happens ends up being about the same. And then you keep moving and you populate the jet, and eventually you get this stratification, which is giving us that flat to slightly inverted power law, um, and then it breaks, and here you would see the optically thin power law. So you'll see quite a few um, of this throughout this talk. That's why I wanted to really make you understand why it's important. And the maximum synchrotron self-absorption, I call it like the jet break, is extremely important, actually. And I think a lot of people didn't think about why it was so important, because you just think, oh, OK, the acceleration just happens along the jet, OK? <clears throat> but what this is telling you, of course, is that at the highest frequency, this component is the most compact part of the jet, which is where those particles are emitting. So if you see this break, it gives you information about where the jet is lighting up, effectively. and then. Um, also, beyond this break, you're optically thin. So this is the part of the um, emission that tells you about the particle distribution. Here, you actually don't even need to have a power law. You can get this flat spectrum with a thermal distribution with the same stratification. I'll show you that a little bit later. So these two pieces of information can be really important if we're trying to understand things like where the emission is starting from and what kind of particles are giving us the emission. Okay? So this is extremely garish, and I apologize for this, but I was trying to give you a sense of what you look at. If you're not familiar with radio observations of compact jets, it's kind of interesting. You might think, oh, you just see the whole jet. But because of this self-absorption effect, what's happening is, so I've kind of drawn that same spectrum again, and I've tried to color code it. So say you pick out this observing frequency, and you look at the jet. Then the part of the jet that has its photosphere, exactly the frequency is going to dominate. That'll be your brightest part. And then each piece of the jet that's moving out this way and this way contributes less and less, the neighboring parts a bit less, then further and further away. And so you end up getting this sort of Gaussian where it's fading away in flux until it goes back down. And so when you look at a jet, you basically see a Gaussian sort of blob that's centered on the photosphere that's picking out that frequency. Um, and this is important because um, Again, it's telling us about what we're going to see, and I'll mention this thing called core shift as well. But another thing that's very important to understand is that if you crank up the, if you imagine everything is staying the same in the jet, so you have the same geometry, but now, and the same emission region, but now you just pump in more power, um, you can work out 
that this break frequency will move up. You're basically increasing the flux. You're increasing the density in the magnetic field. So you're pushing the characteristic power forward, frequency forward, and you get this relationship where it scales positively with the accretion rate. Now remember that because these are all things I'm going to be coming back to in this talk. It gives us information. Does it only depend on the accretion rate uh, changing with a jet not changing, or is there something else going on? I only have a couple more slides of this phenomenology, and then I'm going to move into the, and into the main part of the talk. But if I switch now to power units, so nu, f nu, um, I drew this kind of badly. This should go up a little bit higher, as I'll show you. But you can see, now if I pick, I made this kind of red splodgy area saying, let's say that the acceleration or the jet lights up at this particular area. That's where the particles start to, to be active. Then there's no emission coming from this region. So that last region near the break is going to be dominating. And you can see in the power that the power is basically very strongly dominated by the emission right at that zone, because you don't have anything else um, really contributing from this part. And that's why in the AGN community, first of all, you get a kind of squash Gaussian that's very localized at that point. It wouldn't be as wide because you have less contributions. We're not sure what's happening down here. That's part of what we're trying to understand. This is where all the causality to the black hole is. Um, but AGN modelers, for, of blazars in particular, for many years have basically been able to model the entire spectrum more or less from what they call a single zone. You don't even need the whole jet because it's so dominated by what's happening at this one particular area. And that's interesting because um, what that's telling you is that there's something special about some particular part of the jet where things are lighting up. And there's been a lot of theory about what sets that off and what, you know, what sets that region. But um, so far, there hasn't been, I don't know, a lot of luck. I think people have been focusing more on trying to understand the details of polarization, particle physics in that zone. And I'm more interested in trying to, again, connect this back to the black hole a bit more and get some understanding of what determines this. So um, there's a lot of ideas in the AGN community about why that zone is single zone. And I'll just give you a, couple, a little bit of an idea about this. Um, Sasha Tchaikovsky and, and uh, Omer Bromberg had this nice simulation where they were showing the effect of taking different jets with different environments and simulating the, how the jets look different depending on the power in the jet and the outer environment. So there's this play between intrinsic properties of the jet and the external medium and what determines the emission properties that we're trying to figure out. And um, going back to people like Alan Marsher and then people who work on DLBI like on the Mojave Group and Cohen, there's been a lot of work coming up this idea that, well, the zone, when it's fitted, tends to be really far from the black hole in a lot of the blazars. It's like 10 to the 5 gravitational radii, or, you know, if you think about it as the, the sort of characteristic size of the black hole, it's far. Um, so what sets this dissipation zone? Why is the jet sort of trundling along? Because it must be there. And then what makes it suddenly start to emit most of the light at that point? So the idea has been that there might be this acceleration or collimation zone as this thing is tunneling out. And then something maybe happens in the environment or something internal that gives you a standing shock of some kind. And that's maybe why you would get the light at that point. Um, but... Um, yeah, I'll, and I'll explain to you that, you know, this is interesting, but one question is, is this universal for all jets? Because, as I'll show you in a bit, we have a lot of the same phenomenology in X-ray binaries, and we have very different environments there. So you wouldn't necessarily expect the same type of phenomenology in AGN and X-ray binaries, and as I'll show you, we actually do start to see that. So maybe there's a chance that there's more of an intrinsic influence some part of the way, and we have to try to tease this apart. Now, Sasha and uh, Omer, in these papers, were looking at, for instance, the, um, this is thinking about the external environment, why you might get a shock at a particular point. And maybe if you change your density profile because you cross the sphere of influence of the black hole, for instance, you go beyond the Bondi radius, and so you suddenly drop in density, that this might change your characteristics of the jet. And the, they looked at this in terms of things like the kink stability, in, um, that stability to kink instabilities. And basically, um, depending on you know, the different kinds of jets, this uh, lambda, if it goes below one, you become kink unstable. And they were looking at this as a way to maybe distinguish between the different types of jets, but not specifically looking at necessarily um, this question of dissipation alone. Now, this movie, for whatever reason, always starts, and I want to say, whoops. Uh, yeah, I just want to say something about it before I go. So just to give you an example, um, of how, so that's the outside larger environment, but you also might have the accretion flow 
giving a big effect. And we think that that's actually the case in telling you something about the jet dynamics. And so these are some simulations um, from within our group. So Matthew Liska, who's here, and he just came um, as a postdoc, I think, last week. Um, and then my PhD student, uh, Koshik, have been working together uh, with his code hammer on these large scale simulations. But this is a very small, the same exact jet with the same power, but you have basically a different geometry of the accretion disk. And so this is a disk that's about 500 gravitational radii across. This disk takes up the entire grid. We're gonna zoom out and goes out to something like 10 to the six or something gravitational radii. And I know that my intuition used to always be that if you have a, a squeezing, like more collimation, you think intuitively like you squeeze the water and it sort of squirts out, that maybe more collimation would give you a faster jet. But it's actually interesting that you need the jet to spread out, and then that's what allows the field lines to spread out, which gives you a pressure gradient and sort of accelerates the jet further along. And so what you find is that the smaller disk actually, oh yeah, now I have to, sorry about this. Um, you, as we zoom out, this is in the Lorentz factor. You see that you get a wider jet that's much faster with this small disk because it's less collimated. It's able to spread out, and then you get a fast spine compared to this narrow, slower jet you get with much more collimation. So what I'm trying to show here is a sense that we, we do understand a bit about the effects, or quite a lot, I'd say, about the effect of the various environment on the jet dynamics. And we're trying now to see if we can tie this into the particle types of, of, um, of characteristics. So then there's also the intrinsic physics. And if you have an ideal jet, which means, let's just say that the jet is cold material, and you have a magnetic field, then basically you can calculate with ideal magnetohydrodynamics just the conservation laws from this. Um, and you can understand more or less the dynamics of the jet on its own. So if you, if you look at the system, it's a closed system. So the specific um, power, basically the specific energy per mass flux or power flux per mass flux is going to be a constant throughout the jet. And the Lorentz factor, um, basically, you just have a multiplication of the Lorentz factor, and sigma is the magne magnetization. So what happens is you have kind of all the energy in the bank of the magnetic field at the bottom of the jet, and then as you move out along the jets, because the magnetic fields are spreading, and um, you start to get this gradient, and you, and you accelerate the jet, and by the time you're out here, you've put most of your power into the kinetic power. And this has been known for a long time. There's many papers that looked at this. Ideally, what we're now able to do is with simulations, start to look at on very large scales. So this is showing you basically tracking along in the field line um, out to 10 to the 5 gravitational radii. This mu is that total conserved quantity. And then this magnetization is basically going down. And the Lorentz factor in red is going up. So you're just translating magnetic energy into um, the flow. So all of that is very nice and clean. Now the problem comes in when you want to think about the non-ideal effects. And that's why we're having so many problems, is because non-ideal effects, this dissipation, this is stuff that's really coming down to microphysical level, is very hard to calculate at the same scales of these large macroscopic um, types of jet systems. And so coming back to, now you see why that introduction was so important. If we look at the spectrum of a jet, um, ignore these for a second. But if we just start at this break and we inject with some kind of hot particles, in this case, you can see above the break, it's optically thin, so these are thermal particles. But if we don't do anything to keep those particles hot, then they're going to adiabatically cool away or radiatively cool, and you're not going to be able to maintain. So if you put all that dynamics, that simple dynamics, and conserve everything, but don't put in additional heating into the particles, this is what you're going to get. You can't explain these flat spectra. And so it's been known also for a long time that we have to magically heat the particles. And that's pretty much what everybody does. If you look at jet models, semi-analytical, whether we do that or you know, add something to, to GRMHD simulations, we generally have to add some kind of particle dissipation. And the dissipation is the big mystery, right? And so now we're trying to get to this question of what is it that's doing the heating and how does it tie into all this flow and where does the energy actually come from? And, um, and then, yeah, as I was saying, so this is a thermal distribution, but you could also have, of course, a power law, and that usually is pretty obvious when you look in the spectrum. But for the flat spectrum, it doesn't matter. And, this, and so we're also trying to understand which particles are happening where in the jets.
Okay, and the final slide about this is now looking at this question of what in the outer, you know, some combination of this dynamics where you have pressure balance from what's inside the jet and what's happening outside the jet would actually lead to some kind of recollimation shock or some kind of zone outside. And from M87, which is the black hole that we've been looking at with EHT, we have phenomenal um, information from VLBI, where we can look at the profile. So this is the radius of the jet as a function of distance. And you know the EHT measurement, of course, is going to be down and very small. But you see that there's basically a quadratic, so it's like a parabolic shape up until pretty close to the Bondi radius. And then it seems to go off into a more conical flow. And so what this means is that the jet seems to be collimated actively, probably by the disk winds like we were seeing. And then something happens, it reshuffles, and then it starts to uh, open up more conically. And so this is giving you an example with the M87 of where we think maybe one of these big dissipation regions might be, but this is very far from the EHT. And yet, with the EHT, we are seeing light, obviously, and also with VLBI, we're seeing light well below this region. And so the question that we're posing now is what is happening between here and here? How can we study it? And how can we study the translation of this dynamical energy into the particles? OK, I am totally not going to talk about PIC simulations. I just want to flash this up that this is the state of the art. If you want to understand the particle distributions, um, what people are doing now is uh, really looking at individual particles or sort of, well, close to individual particles. They're, they're uh, scale particles in electromagnetic fields. And what you can do is basically look at how they interact with magnetic fields, and, um, and they build up their own currents and fields. And you can, from first principles, start with the thermal distribution. Here are ions and electrons, and start to build up in time the power law. And the problem is that the scales of these simulations are down at the ion skin depth, which is a very tiny number. And the scales that we look at in our big simulations are more like you know, the smallest cells are maybe some fraction of a tenth of a gravitational radius, which is a very large scale compared to this. And so the order of magnitudes in scale from what is actually driving the energization to um, the, the dynamics that we're trying to understand, it's like 10 to the 20. It can be 10 to the 20. So you're not going to capture this very easily right now all in one simulation. So what we're trying to do is take, use this as a guide in how we implement these types of physical processes into the jets and try to understand where these things might be happening, why they might be happening. And that's how these two areas are coming together. So that was kind of um, this real broad, I would say, um, kind of phenomenological introduction to the problem. And I hope that gives you some sense of what we're fighting with is this enormous scale differences and a lot of unknowns. But there's things that we do actually know, and we're trying to find ways to put this together. And one way you can rephrase this question is when we try to connect this dissipation region, which has been of such great interest to the AGN community for so long, uh, to, let's say, the EHT region, which is now becoming of interest, what's happening below what we always thought was the important dissipation part of the jets? And is the thermal, is the, are the particles basically staying in a kind of thermal distribution and then only becoming non-thermal after this point, which is where the jet would then light up because they would become brighter and enhanced? Um, and do we have a way of studying this region a little bit more? And what I'm going to show you is that we are starting to see something like this. And so if you make now um, a schematic of this type of, of spectrum, you would have, this is that flat to inverted spectrum I was talking about where the power law starts associated with this region. And I've kind of exaggerated this. It was actually be down here somewhere. But you would have some kind of thermal distribution popping up here. And you would probably need some energy injection to boost the, the power from the particles from here to here. And so we're looking at spectra and modeling now in more um, phenomenological models to fit actual data to try to get a better handle on this problem. And so that's what I want to start to talk about now. So is there evidence for this thermalized flow at the bottom of jets? And I would say yes. And uh, one of our favorite sources is Sagittarius A star, soon to be um, hopefully an EHT published source. We're working on it. Um, and this is an old figure going back already to uh, Yuan et al. in 2003, but it's very nice showing the power as a function of frequency. And what you see is that there's basically the power's peaking in the submillimeter 
which is why the submillimeter is an interesting frequency for EHT. Um, but there's a steep drop. We now have much better limits. Basically, we see no sign of a power law. If there was a power law, it'd be very hard to hide right there. So Sagittarius A star seems to be, as far as we can tell, completely dominated by thermal particles. And you can get this flat spectrum just from having that propagate along. You don't actually need to have excessive particle acceleration. You can have a little bit. Um, do we see this in other sources, or is Sagittarius star a one-off? And that's actually been an interesting question. I think we have this tendency to think of Sagittarius A star as this unique object, but of course it's the most common kind of black hole in the universe, and we would really like to understand this. Um, so we can't see this in other black holes, but we can see in other supermassive black holes, but we can see this in X-ray binaries. And there's been a lot of work now quite recently looking at X-ray binaries that go down to accretion rates that are almost approachable to Sagittarius A star. And we're looking at um, this sort of end of the jet, here's the flat spectrum, and then you get sometimes this little bump or peak similar to Sagittarius A star, but we see this drop in, this is one source, different um, models, AO620, J1118, there's a couple other ones as well. And what seems to be happening is that when we look at low luminosity sources, we're able to, the, the bright emission from the outer parts of the jets is basically not swamping this emission and we couldn't have seen it before. And so we're revealing information about the nature of the particles and that they're not being excited very much down at the base of the jets. And the question is, what happens then between there and the outer part of the jet? And so um, one of the things we're trying to do now is make phenomenological models that are using the information we have from these ideal GRMHD simulations. So we know, for instance, that we have some conserved energy along the jet. This is a profile from a simplified model. And the magnetic energy is going down as we accelerate, basically, the protons in the jet, and then the electrons are being carried along. And we match this profile to the best studied AGN, which is M87. And so we're creating a dynamical model for the first time. And then what we're trying to do is actually put in these particle processes in order to understand um, where this acceleration might be happening. And so what's interesting is if you move away from single zone models, which is something that, like as I said, fitting AGN as a single zone has been kind of the norm, but if you start to fit this into the dynamical picture, you get a lot more information, and it also breaks a lot of the degeneracies that we've been struggling with a little bit in the field. And so what this is, is um, this is a blazar, PKS 2155, and these are six epics. They're spread out. Um, they're multiplied so that it spreads them out a little bit. But there's monitoring efforts now that are multi-wavelength and simultaneous, um, both for AGN and X-ray binaries, where you can really study the source across the entire waveband. And that's important because if you're trying to understand the dynamics, separate out the dynamical effects from the particle effects, you need to really have the whole picture there. And what we've done is if you fit each spectrum individually, you end up with a lot of you know, free parameters, and this is very much how the field has been plagued with uh, single zone models, is that you don't have a lot of information, you have quite a bit of degeneracy. But one of the things that you can do is you can start to say, this jet is not changing a lot, it's an AGN, it's not changing a lot over very long time scales, and so probably what's happening is you have um, a fixed geometry and then some fluctuations on top of this, and so you can use these multiple, um, these, sorry. <laughs> Um, I don't have, it's not time yet, is it? Oh my God. Um, so so um, basically, you, you end up, um, yeah, you can, you can free some of these parameters and treat this like, like a linked system. And then basically, this is now, you're taking a lot of these parameters and making them joint across these different uh, epochs. And what you find is that this is the one I wanted you to pay attention to. A lot of the parameters in general start to focus into a more narrow region of parameter space. They were all over the place before. But where um, this region where the dissipation is happening, and if you look at most of these parameters, and I'll show you some of the, um, the, the fit um, Monte Carlo fits, it's really wild, and this has been the problem, that you can fit these, these shapes, these models, but you can't really derive a lot of the physics out of it. But by actually using the dynamics that we understand um, and combining it with the physics, we're actually able to look at the dissipation region. It starts to converge on a number that is actually quite a bit lower than what people had been thinking for 
for instance, 600 gravitational radii for where most of the emission is coming from is not going to be the Bondi radius of this black hole. Black hole Bondi radii tend to be much bigger. This is a heavy black hole. And so what we're seeing is clear sign that the dissipation region is actually much closer in, in this uh, black hole. And if you look at, just to show you a little bit about the um, fitting, if we do the individual fits, you see a lot of um, degeneracy, and we're not even basically converging on the best fit, which is the Xs. But when we start to use a dynamical model together with this joint fitting and use information we have about the structure of the jet and the collimation of the jet, then the whole parameter space starts to get, a, we break a lot of this degeneracy and everything becomes much more censored. We're getting much more realistic and statistically significant fits. And so this is a new technique that we're trying to work on. My PhD student, uh, Matteo Lucchini, has developed a lot of this. And what we're hoping to do is there's a huge population of these sources, but from looking at the population, we can start to study the trends and where this dissipation is happening. And this is just one of the first ones. But what might be interesting is to look at M87, because M87, um, again, now is one of these um, event horizon telescope sources. We'd like to be able to understand where the dissipation region is. We're now looking at the um, new F new. We've actually um, compiled the spectrum of the core, everything within about a half arc second. So this is very close. As, it's something like 32 parsecs. It's pretty good um, to isolate this away from these outer knots. And what you find is that, again, this is I'm, I'm focusing only on this parameter for this talk, but there's a lot of information in these fits. Um, that the zone where the particles seem to be accelerated into a, part of, uh, a power law is at about 100 gravitational radii away from the black hole. And this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, um, I showed you that collimation profile of M87 where it goes from being collimated and sort of conical to being, or uh, parabolic to conical at 10 to the 5 gravitational radii. So people had thought that maybe the jets, the idea that the jets turn on because of this change in the outer medium um, was applied also to M87. But as we start to look closer in, very close to the core with information we have, it looks like the jet, there's another zone where the particles are actually being activated much closer in. And in fact, this zone is even closer in than the blazar I just showed you. And the blazar is about 100 times more powerful than M87. So what that means is that there may be some dependence on the power that starts to argue for an intrinsic um, cause for where this happens. But that being said, if you look at the VLBI, I think this is 86 gigahertz, yeah, a map from Hada et al., you do see that there's this weird sort of pinchy region right around 100 gravitational radii. And so the question is maybe there's also some reason that the jet is starting to come in on itself or shock itself. So these are a lot of the questions that we're starting to be able to probe with combinations of VLBI and broadband fitting. But I'm going to change gears now and talk about X-ray binaries for the last you know, part of my talk, and then I'll come back to simulations. Now, X-ray binaries, uh, you can give a whole talk on this, right? But these are basically little black holes, and they show a lot of the same phenomenology as AGN, but during a single outburst. So they basically start in quiescence, and they move through this phase space of luminosity and being thermal or non-thermal dominated. And that's not really important to know for this talk, but what is important is to say that they have the longest lived state basically looks like the jets that we see in M87, in blazars, um, these sort of steady, compact jets that the flat spectra are important for. And so we can use these to start to study and see if we see the same phenomenology of dissipation regions in little black holes. Because then you would really have a strong argument that somehow it's not just the environment dominating this, but something intrinsic may be driven by uh, magnetohydrodynamical instabilities. And I think that's where we're starting to think. So um, I said I've been sort of thinking about this for a while. This is uh, the first multi-wavelength spectrum that was ever taken simultaneously from X-ray binary. Um, this was new at the time, 20 years ago or so. People hadn't done this. And you need to look at these sources simultaneously in order to um, catch, they're changing so much you really need to catch them within days of each other. So that was quite difficult. And at the time, Chandra had just been launched, and we were modeling Sagittarius Star, actually, for the first time as a jet model. And um, when this Spectre came out, uh, Rob Fender showed it to me and said, hey, can you model this? And so I thought, I'll just be lazy. I'll take my Sagittarius Star model, which is thermal particles, and just throw it in and see if I can model the X-ray binary. And what I found was I couldn't. Uh, what I needed to do was add particle acceleration, so add this power law, but also that the power law I found had to be offset from the black hole by about uh, somewhere between 100 and 1,000. Um, 
But I didn't put this together with the AGM thing for quite some time. So it's interesting how these develop. You work on something for a while and you don't really think about this as a problem. But over the last intervening you know, 20 years, the field has evolved incredibly. And now what we have, and this is where that jackpot collaboration I mentioned comes in, there's groups of people who are looking at x-ray binaries and during these outbursts and really able to track the direct response of the jets. So you're looking at the direct response of the dynamics of the jets and the particles in real time to changes in the accretion flow. And this used to be the sort of poster child of this. Uh, it was the best source that we had, J1836. And you can see this is pretty recent. I mean, just from the last five or six years, we've only been able to do this. And one of the reasons is that you need to have simultaneous x-ray, but also infrared Submillimeter is quite important, and radio. And if any of you ever sit on submillimeter techs, please listen. <laughs> it is very hard to get submillimeter techs to realize that time dependence is important. And so we've had, we're starting to make, you know, breakthrough into this field, but it's very important for constraining. You can see this flat spectrum, and then this, this break frequency is moving. And what you see is that this is the, basically the accretion disk. So as you go from green to red, you're going from low to high accretion you see that the break from green to red, this is low accretion, this is high accretion, it's moving outwards in the jet. Now, this is interesting. Um, so there's this clear trend, and it's not the only source. As we start to get more and more of these really nice data sets, we're always seeing this trend from low uh, accretion rates corresponding with the break being at a higher frequency to high accretion rate and it moves outwards. And this is interesting. Oh, and it's also because whatever's driving this, if you look at where the break happens as a function of days, it can be extremely dramatic. So here you see a more secular evolution, but sometimes within one day, three orders of magnitude change in these structures. So I don't think this is being driven by environmental changes. This looks like something really intrinsic to the jet physics. And now the question is, does this relate to what we're seeing in the AGN? Of course, in AGN, these types of changes, if it was intrinsic, wouldn't happen in a lifetime that we could see. So we would have to study this statistically. And that's where we're kind of going with this. Um, but this is important because that, remember at the very beginning when I did all that phenomenology, it was kind of to build up to this, that this break frequency, if it's just this jet kind of stays the same and the zone kind of stays the same and then you're just changing the power, you would expect this, this correlation where the break frequency would go up with accretion rate. We're seeing the exact opposite in all of the different sources. So this, um, and when I showed you that difference between the bright blazar and NMA7, I mean, we don't have a huge amount of statistics yet, but it seems like the trend in AGN is quite similar, that high accretion rates are pushing this thing further out in the jet. And so that gives us a benchmark for theory to try to understand what's really behind all of this. Um, and if you want to be a skeptic and say, oh, you're just seeing optical depth effects and that break isn't really happening from somewhere far in the jet, I think there's some really new, interesting results. This is a source GX339 uh, minus four flat spectrum. Here's that break frequency, very well resolved. And um, if you fit this, it's coming from about 3,000 or so gravitational radii away from the black hole. Well, if that, if you believe that, this region in the X-ray, which is coming from the black hole, you would expect a lag between these two. And now people are developing fast optical timing. So again, this is so new, it's just happening in the last couple of years. But what we're finding with cross correlations between the X-ray and the infrared is that there is a lag of about 100 milliseconds, which corresponds to roughly a, a variation of about a thousand gravitational radii. And it's not just this source, but we're starting to find it now for any source where we can actually do this. So I think what um, we're developing now is a picture that there's a dissipation zone, just like in blazars, in X-ray binaries, and that it really is offset far away from the black hole, and that what's driving it, at least in X-ray binaries, is some kind of magnetohydrodynamic instability probably, something happening inside the jet that's related to the power going in, somewhat with the environment. And now we want to try to connect all this with the AGN. Um, that's, and there's also QPOs in the infrared, but I won't talk about that. So I'll just mention briefly some work in one of my postdocs that we're doing more sophisticated models, which are not um, as sophisticated as GRMHD, but the advantage of doing a semi-analytical model is that you can actually um, you can actually fit data with it. And we're, we're able to understand if we associate this break with maybe crossing the magnetosonic fast point, which is where you would lose maybe causal information and be more amenable to shocks in the flow, that that height seems to scale with the magnetic power or the accretion weight. 
in the same trend. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the answer, but we're starting to look for answers in um, more sophisticated models. <laughs> okay, so last few minutes of my talk, I just want to mention briefly the work highlighting, of course, Matthew, you can ask him all about this, but we're able to now do these amazing uh, large-scale simulations of jets to really get the dynamics down at high resolution. Um, I'm not talking at all about tilted disks, but um, I just wanted to flash there's some amazing stuff here that you should ask about with Matthew's code hammer run on GPUs. But the largest ever 2D code run to this point, uh, highest resolution out to the largest scales, it's really important because now what we can do is we can start to, from first principles, first of all, match the, um, the collimation profiles of real AGN, like M87, at the same time that we can start to study uh, in detail the interaction of the inner part of the jet. Here's the disk, the inner part of the jet, which is pointing flux dominated. And then you get this region here, which is an interaction region, where you start to see these sort of pinches and, um, and oscillations, and this is basically instabilities uh, happening in this shear zone. And this region is where we think is becoming the, where the light is being produced in the jets. Um, and so if we can understand what sets this off and start to correlate it with these um, scaling break frequencies, then uh, we have something we can benchmark in the simulations to actual data. And that's a really big point of progress for our field at the moment. Um, so I showed, this is again that ideal uh, conservation of magnetic field going down. Lorentz factor going up, we can study now the effect of the dissipation, albeit numerical dissipation. So we're not, from first principles, able to calculate actual dissipation. But what we can see is that when now in the solid line you have, um, sorry, in the dashed line you have kind of the ideal simulation where we just have a smooth wall and there's no shear boundaries. And then what Kozik has been doing is studying as a function of distance along the jet, basically uh, what happens when you start to have these instabilities. And you can see that offset from the black hole, some distance, the instabilities start to pick up. And if you look now, we didn't have this component over here, but now we have thermal heat. This is the particles getting activated. This is what makes the light. We can start to track where that energy is going and where it starts to be excited. And that's where we can connect this now to these break frequencies. Um, and so there's a lot that's gonna be happening, but you can see in M87, um, that the light seems to be concentrated along the sort of opening angle in this sheath. And, um, and so this is the place we're really concentrating on. And this is just some work now, again, with Matthew and Koshik, looking at the sheath region in another simulation. And I'll end with one slide where you can see this is, um, this is quite hot. This is the temperature along this zone. When you look at that sheath as a function of radius, this is the density, this is the magnetic field, you're basically getting the Blanford and Koenigle scalings out. And the temperature is being maintained isothermally, which is what I said you need to get the flat spectrum, because those instabilities are basically heating up the particles and keeping them hot. So, you know, you can always ask, we have to, and we have to ask as a community, this is numerical dissipation, you know, how much can we connect this to real dissipation? We don't have the full physics in the code, but it's definitely promising. And if you make the spectrum, and this is work from uh, Koshik and Matthew, compared to M87, that sheath region is not too far off, but there are differences and we have to understand that. So I'm just gonna end by saying, you know, you, we heard Ido today talking about all the new sources that are being found. These same problems are gonna be really applicable to understanding the jets coming out of, you know, coll colliding neutron stars as well. And we're going to have a lot of sources. And I think that this chance to move from reactive to predictive modeling is coming. Um, I hope that I've given you a picture to some extent of how we're connecting something as maybe um, abstract as turbulence in these simulations <coughs> to real benchmarkable things that we see in the observations. And there's ways that we can bridge between them with, with uh, models. I will just mention that both of the people who led a lot of this work are on the job market. I think Koshik is giving a talk here in November. So please uh, look at their stuff. And I'll just leave it at, at this um, on this slide. But I think basically large scale dynamics and macroscopic properties strongly influence the microphysics. AGN and X-ray binaries share similar trends. Um, and we're moving away from the single zone and we're starting to really understand how to connect dissipation to the, to the black hole. This is very important for EHT and especially the fact that we need to combine EHT with multi-wavelengths, so stay tuned. And the outlook is really um, radiation 
in dissipative processes, non-ideal processes in uh, in these simulations. And I think you'll be seeing these these areas converge in the next you know decade or so. Thank you. <clears throat>
we see basically kind of the same problem you see with AGM, that there's a dichotomy. Sometimes synchrotron dominates and sometimes inverse It used to be, I mean, spectrum is very hard to tell those things apart. You basically fit both. But it is all this timing work and the lags that's starting to tell you how the emission is coming out in reflection. So what we're understanding now is that when we look at X-ray binary, there are times where the emission is, I'd say most of the time, dominated by Comptonization. But whether you call it a corona or the base of the jet, I'm a bit agnostic about it. I mean, in our models, we kind of lump this together, and we can, we can basically fit it either way. So I think that region is connected. And you know, if you look at these simulations, where's the corona, where's the, I mean, I think the corona probably is this inner disk wind area in a real system. In AGN, um, it's usually much easier to pick that apart. I mean, in M87, uh, it's much, you really can't fit this core data with synchrotron self Compton anymore. So it looks like synchrotron is probably the best bet for that one. So it really does come down to the spectral modeling to some extent. Um, it's, we can't do the labs as easily as we could in X ray binaries. So I think there we're, we're learning more from the X ray binaries. A bit more, but um, yeah, I think the X-rays are most of the time coming in X-ray binaries from very close to the black hole. Yeah. And I've changed on that, by the way. I used to I think. Was yes. Um, so the the. The simulations right now, we can reproduce the, the collimation shape, like this, this sort of um, parabolic shape. But we haven't actually gotten, we haven't ever gotten as far out as trying to get a, you know, some kind of recollimation shock or something like that. I don't, actually, Matthew would probably be the better one to answer, seeing right behind you. Um, do you think that we, with the current simulations, if we could run them out long enough to get the instabilities, would we be able to see some kind of shape change? Yeah. I mean, we haven't done it yet. I mean, it's related to that simulation I showed from Sasha. <laughs> People have been thinking about this, but now we have the chance to do this longer with better resolution, and so maybe we can resolve the instabilities a bit more realistically. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I had. Oh, you've got something else. No, I, actually, I had um, just one more. I was going to put this up because oh. I'm here. People haven't really signed up for Monday. So, oh, oops. Yeah. I was going to. I had this, you know. You can ask me about masculine, all these things. Um, uh, there's a lot of things that connect people here. So, I'm around. I think tomorrow's starting to get kind of full, but Monday before I leave for the airport, I saw there was still time. So, chat with me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm squatting in Martin's office, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you.